presentation to the council of the plan for development for uh, the property on the lakefront. The centerpiece of the presentation, of course, involves the Pinnacle property, uh, but uh, what he's going to outline to you, I think, is a, uh, some of the possibilities of the development of the property just to the west of the parking garage and show you how that could all uh, fit together. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we have highlighted as we have gone through uh, this process and we started this process was that uh, the, the property that we're talking about, the Pinnacle property, originally was not part of the lakefront plan that was approved uh, by the voters in 2007. Uh, so this past session in the, in the legislature, we introduced a bill, a local bill, Senate Bill 211, handled by Senator Johns, and that bill uh, incorporated the Pinnacle property into the lakefront uh, as far as the, uh, the voter referendum uh, was concerned, the 2007 voter referendum. The standards and the design uh, guidelines that were approved by the voters in that voter referendum uh, were um, validated by the state legislature, and then it was also um, uh, amended to include the Pinnacle property. Uh, the net effect of the uh, of the legislation, of course, is to uh, to allow the Pinnacle property to be developed by the city in accordance with the same mm -hmm. uh, processes and procedures uh, that the rest of the lakefront is subject to. And we can get into some discussion about that a little bit more during the meeting if necessary, or we can even get into it next week when you actually consider it uh, for, a, for a vote approving the resolution. But tonight, basically, we put on the agenda a resolution that authorizes the city to go out for a request for proposals. And we'll outline to you the timeline and how that'll flow as well. But I'd like for, uh, for Steve Ood, uh, if he would, to come forward and uh, make his presentation. I think most of you know Steve already. Uh, we have really uh, enjoyed working with Steve. Uh, this is not his first time uh, working in Lake Charles. In fact, uh, the design guidelines and the plan that was approved by the voters in 2007 uh, he was a part of that team that came to Lake Charles back then as, in the, the post uh, reader recovery effort and worked very closely with us and others uh, in developing that plan and, and I think he was uh, also one of the lead quote unquote architects of helping us get uh, to where we are today. So uh, Steve, I want to thank you again for your, your work on behalf of the city and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, Mayor Roach. <clears throat> Thank you for allowing me to present this information to you today. Um, just a sidebar, we were here two weeks before we actually conducted our workshop in uh, early uh, June, and our charrette team was very complimentary <coughs> about the flags, and actually it's, it's an obvious uh, contribution to the downtown. We actually gestured the idea of allowing that to come into this new development because of Memorial Park which exists right outside the doors of, of this project. So congratulations on that work. It really is, has an impact on the city. Um, just by way of background, the mayor uh, indicated that we were involved in, you know, post Charette or during the Charette um, uh, in 2007. Uh, I recall that period very vividly because we were coming from um, uh, New Orleans uh, shortly after Katrina, and we had just finished work in Mississippi. Uh, uh, for the Katrina event, and then, lo and behold, we felt we were blessed here in Louisiana, and South Louisiana, Southwest Louisiana, that we had not been hit, and we get hit by Rita. Um, and so we, we were immediately engaged by Louisiana, the government, to come in and assist in planting seeds that would be used in the community, uh, or communities that could be transferable. You know, the intent was that Lake Charles had uh, some pretty significant devastation, but the, the, the objective was not simply for Lake Charles. It was to do a, a, a pattern book that could be used in other places. And, and so that was very important to us because we took it very seriously. And the, and the document we keep referring to uh, with the Charette Report is this document here. I don't know if any of you are still, you know, 2007 is almost 10 years ago. It's a long time. And during the workshop we conducted a month ago or a few weeks ago, it kept coming up, you know, what report are you referring to? No. Well, this is the report. And so to be clear, this report was a vision. It was a, an under, understanding of how do we rebuild Louisiana in a resilient way. It, it, was, a, it was about trying to create places that people wanted to migrate to. Okay, And it was essentially a concept. And then we later came back and reinforced the concept with what we refer to as a code, or smart code. 
And that smart code you've also adopted uh, in a very broad way. And so our task was to come in to the community and, and have an outreach effort through various tentacles, whether it was the um, tourist bureau or the government or citizens, to ask questions about how you see memorializing this report in further detail. What do you envision us using the property for? So we're trying to get an understanding. Connected to that, in 2008, we conducted a market study by two of the country's most significant market analysts. One was retail commercial, and the other was residential. Both of them told us that in order for the downtown to be reinvigorated, we had to create a mixed-use environment. We had to create a nucleus project that would be used as the model to be replicated in your entire downtown. The problem with the 2008 report is you had a very soft market, as did the rest of the country. And you didn't have the, essentially, the, 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 the traction that you have today. And we are now realizing that the traction you're about to receive is substantial. And we need to make sure we're ready. And that's the objective we had in preparing the next step. The property that we were working with, you all know, as the Pinnacle site. Uh, it is the site located in blue. Actually, the very center of this blue uh, diagram here is the parking garage that exists. So the, the property to the west is not Pinnacle. The property to the east is. During the workshop, it was brought to our attention that there had been various vendors who had a, approached the administration about perhaps doing you have introducing uses that we had not yet explored and we felt we should expand the scope so we went not only into the pinnacle in detail but into the western portion as well so the, the scope expanded during the workshop and so that this property you're seeing here is more than the 9.2 acres it's more like uh, 20 acres um, so we created actually this is one of the final drawings, we created about 12 different schemes based on input. And the schemes all evolve around the smart code that was adopted by this body in 2007. The vision here is more specific in that it actually encompasses uses. And so that we can understand, I'm not sure you can see this arrow where you are. Yeah, OK. So what we wanted to try and do is, is create a market that was a viable market to investors who would want to come into Lake Charles based upon the dynamics that exist today. So just to orientation wise, this is I-10. Your current service road runs across the frontage of I-10. It's a one-way corridor uh, heading east off of I-10. And the parking garage that is here is all that exists on this site today. During the workshop, we had lots of conversations about what could be done with the parking garage. I think it was generally assumed that it should be torn down when we arrived, um, which is pretty understandable in, uh, because of the condition it's in today. But if you begin looking at the deck in a little different light, it, I believe, and I still think now in, in light of how we developed this plan, it has huge value. Um, that garage actually parks 400 cars. It was designed for 500, but the, but the module was inefficient, so it's been converted to about a 400 car deck. If you were to build that deck today, you would be spending about $7 million. Um, if you were to take the parking that the deck currently incorporates, it would take roughly half of the property that Pinnacle has just to park the cars that it currently has. And so from a business perspective, it made absolutely no sense to park 50% or four and a half acres of waterfront property. And so it was our proposal, and in this scheme, it is essentially the reality of, of the layout, that we renovate that garage. And everyone we spoke with during the workshop, which was over 150 people, said it was just ugly. It wasn't necessarily something that they didn't like or want, it was just ugly. And you know, in today's world, when we do parking garages, we actually create liners that hide those garages. They're internalized. So we opted to create liners. So the blue buildings that you see 
on all frontages to um, the deck, including actually the waterfront, are what we refer to as liners. And this, in, in this case, they're living units. They're condominium. Um, the block to the east of the garage is about six acres, and it encompasses a mix of uses, which was part and parcel of your resolution in 2007. Hotel, retail, commercial, and living. When we do multifamily today, the multifamily module that is a business model that works anywhere in the country is about 200 units, which takes five acres. So this block is a little over five, it's roughly six, because we wanted to incorporate retail and commercial. And that's the business model. Your code specifies that the smart code stipulates that this is walkable. I can't tell you how many times during the workshop we were told, why aren't you incorporating more parks? Or why don't you have more activity zones? The reality is this is just nine acres. And you have done a phenomenal job building parks, waterfront activities, marinas. You have these activities already in place. We don't need to replicate those. We need to connect to them and actually create a life that makes what you've already built more viable and creates viability for what we have. So under your guidelines and under a mandate, you are required to maintain a 25-foot waterfront activity zone on this property. So this plan actually shows a 25-foot boardwalk that runs the entire length of both the east and the west sectors. Here's the garage again here. And here is the boardwalk running all the way to what we would refer to as the beach zone. This building to the northwest is the Wildlife and Fisheries Building. The uh, um, square building located here is your um, travel building, your, your visitor center. Um, the uses that we projected on the western site were essentially a test to see what a, a 185,000 square foot outdoor sports uh, retail center might be looking like, uh, which we've had some interest in, and so we wanted to position that on the site. And you'll notice that this building actually juts out into the water. That red line that you see is actually the shoreline today. You are allowed and permitted to extend the shoreline uh, in this particular zone so you can capture the property to accommodate that use if, in fact, it became a reality. So this was just a test to see how could we perhaps leverage those uses. And here are some of the suggestions that we prepared. Now, I'd also point out the idea that we are creating a roadway. This is actually a public road that would be built as part of this development that would connect all the way to Lakeshore Drive through Price, uh, through the extension of Price Street, which terminates today at Lakeshore Drive. One of the retailing problems that you have with the Pinnacle property is you only have one road in there, and it's a one-way corridor, which requires you to go underneath I-10 all the way to the Yacht Club and then back to enter the property. It cannot retail well. It doesn't connect to the city. So we want and recommend that a connector street be built to connect into this property so that you can come from downtown Lake Charles. You can drive, you can walk, and you can bike. That's a critical piece of, of this proposal. This is a rendering actually showing what we refer to as your farm-based code. These are four-story buildings, which is what your code refers to. It can be five. The uses in these, in these buildings can vary. The ground floor we intended to be retail commercial, the second and third floor rental, and the fourth floor condominium for sale. Your market studies that we received early on said that, you know, you probably have a market, and when I say probably, in 2008 it was a probably, you probably have a market for young uh, professionals, but it wasn't deep. Today you have a huge market for young professionals. That is what the new businesses in this community will be hiring. It's very important that we understand that they're not looking for suburbia. That market is looking for a dynamic urban environment, and the reason they're moving out of state today is because Louisiana has not offered it. New Orleans has, and it is beginning to, to show traction. It is the new frontier, 
and the young professionals are moving there in droves. Where they're not moving is in communities like Lake Charles, Lafayette, any other place. Actually, Baton Rouge is making a, an honest attempt at doing something. They haven't yet begun that traction. They're beginning to see some things evolving. And so this is an opportunity that we have to do something, not only to, to create a hugely animated downtown, but to create a destination for a population that is looking for work, and this place has work. So we need to create that kind of environment. We're going to get them here. Will they, will they stay? If we don't create this kind of environment, they will not. On the other end of the spectrum, the baby boomer, the, the 60 year old plus or minus, is also looking for an urban setting, a, a lifestyle that is a, a very extensive market. The for sale condo product is what that is, and that's what we're looking at the fourth floor for. So these models gesture uh, accommodating those uses. During the workshop, we heard at least 20 times that there needs to be water access to this property. And we fully intended, we had this romantic notion back in 2007 when we did the charrette, and again when we were doing the workshop to create this really great marina until we were deflated and told that you only have a foot and a half of water out there and the cost to continually dredge that was impractical. We do not want to create an impractical business model. So instead what we said, we will extend out to boaters and build piers so that people can come here from contraband bayou from their residences to, to be entertained uh, at this property. And, and we gestured in this, in this rendering a 300 foot pier system with retail buildings um, located at the pier ends that would retail also uh, rentals for canoes and kayaks, um, things that would allow people who currently cannot engage in the activity of the waterfront uh, can, can now become part and parcel of the waterfront. This is a rendering actually looking at the connection at Memorial uh, Park, at the Veterans Memorial, to continue your waterfront activity using the same context. We're not reinventing it. We actually want to continue and, in, 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 uh, expand on the iconic lighting, benches, fencing, landscaping, uh, materials, and allow that palette to continue so you'll be able to walk, which is about a seven and a half minute walk from the convention center to this activity center. There will be a hotel here. There will be um, restaurants. We're looking at at least five restaurants. Uh, there will be living and, and other retailers. And perhaps even long term, a big box retailer who could be a substantial tax paying uh, party to this uh, project. This is the rendering looking at the exit off of I-10 coming off the bridge as soon as you would exit. This is the hotel. We actually developed a slip lane, a road, that parallels the uh, frontage road because we have to get access again, the connectivity tissue that is lacking today. And then some ideas about taking Bilbo Park, our cemetery, and, and actually retrofitting it and cleaning it up and creating a great civic space out of it. Today it is in disrepair. It's a phenomenal space. And we want to try and, and as part of this project, uh, as part of the funding of this uh, proposal, to, to do a retrofit of that property. And then, so the vision you saw just a minute ago, the sketches were, were the result of the input we received from the citizenry. We then took that information and began memorializing it in the form of guiding principles, which follow your smart code. So this document speaks to the regulations. How do the buildings position against the street? In all cases, we have 20-foot sidewalks, 15 to 20-foot sidewalks. We have dining on the sidewalks. We have mandatory incised porches so that people can be protected when they're at restaurants and, and retailing opportunities. Um, we have multi-story buildings. We, we actually indicate materials here. We are not going to allow a developer to take advantage of this city by coming in and building something that will not hold up. So we're specifying materials. This is a draft of this document that you're seeing here. And it will become part of the uh, outreach component that we would uh, go out to the development community on a national level. And we talk about uses, hotel, live, work, commercial. We getting ready for the zoning component. 
you know, this is an interesting diagram. When you look at the dark diagram to the north, that's common property. That's the open space. The, the, the only f infill is the stuff located on the bottom diagram, which are the buildings. We then take, so that when, we, when the developers get this, you know, you've gone through this process a couple of times. It has been less than successful. We don't want to miss our mark this time. And so we're being, being very, very descriptive. This defines how the buildings fit on the site in, in greater detail. Where does the parking go? Parking counts. What do they need to provide? So that when one developer proposes, the other one is on equal footing. Um, we've designed every street already. And so there are seven street types. Here they are. Um, the, the, your smart code talks about connectivity. You know, to be smart, first off, you have to be able to have connectivity. There's no dead ends in here. Um, people can bike, they can walk, and they can drive equally. It is not a monoculture, and that's very important. On-street parking unloads some of the parking garages. Um, and so we've not only shown that dedication, this is the scale of the buildings on site to the water. These are the street sections. We getting into the detail of, of the tree plantings, the sidewalk dimensions, curb types, building placement, all delineated so that when the developer takes the package and begins putting a proposal together, we're comparing apples to apples. All of those are delineated here. At the root of the, the sustainable smart code is walkability. And we, we love talking about walkability. This red circle represents what we refer to as the ped shed. And we often talk about in South Louisiana, people will walk five minutes. It's 1,320 feet. If they have to walk seven and a half minutes, they will drive it 50% of the time. It's a science. And so when we diagram these things, we begin to try and understand this. So if they have to walk 10 minutes, they will drive it 100% of the time. So when we set up our zones, for instance, if, if we do a walk zone from the, um, from the um, assembly center, you're seven and a half minutes. So we have to structure this thing in a way that there's interest from point A to point B. We know that there's discussions about a hurricane museum. That is a part of that walk zone. And so when you begin engaging all of these uses, people will walk it. And that's very, very important. We had, a, we had a discussion during the charrette, and we, we would keep referring to it as, as a workshop because a charrette is five days and we were doing it for only three. Lake Charles, you know, when we were talking about the design of this project, the, the people kept talking about, you know, it's time for us to become more environmentally sustainable. We, we need to make a statement. And what better way than to take this parcel of property, this nine acres, and do it sustainably? Why not do it right? It's, it's, it's no more difficult to do it right. Why not make it walkable? Why not take advantage of the water? Why not do things so that materials are compatible with the district? The architecture is going to be about Lake Charles. It's not going to be about Austin. It's not going to be about New Orleans. It's about the place. So we coded the architecture, and that's in here as well. This is the pedestrian pass. You can see where the side, we have sidewalks on every street. They're minimum of five feet, most cases eight, and in many cases, 25. So they're, they're very walkable. And once we dis defined all of these rules, and this document actually gets into a lot more detail. I didn't cover every aspect of it. Our intent is that we're going to advertise this. Uh, we've had several developers and, and users approach us during this process. We've written their names down. We have a, a master sheet. Um, we are going to invite them to participate in uh, an RFP process. And the RFP process is going to essentially say, this is what the city sees their vision being. It holds true to the 2007 vision. It is highly detailed now. We're going to allow those developers to come forward and put a proposal out. And we're going to grade that proposal. And, and I, what you're seeing before you is a concept score sheet. So that when we get the proposals, we will actually be able to, as a team, take each proposal and score it, and then take the scores and, as a team, discuss the merits and demerits of each of the proposals and shortlist to two, two uh, firms. And those two firms we'll, we will go into negotiations with. And it's timeline specific. We do not have time to waste. That workforce is coming. They're already arriving. We're behind the eight ball. 
It's time to move this forward. That's the urgency, and that's the importance of doing this the way we're doing it. So I'll stop there and, and ask for any questions that you might have. Um, hopefully I can answer them. If I can't, the mayor can. <laughs> yes, Ron. I assure you. Steve. Um, yes. I think I have seen something so close to what you're talking about in Baltimore, Maryland. Yeah. I was there. Yeah. And I took pictures I, on my phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is as close yeah. to what you're saying right now. And there were so many people yes. that flooded that area, that lakefront. Uh, uh, they had condominiums, they had retail stores, yes. they had uh, ships and little scoop boats in the water and little transportation uh, uh, tour boats out there in the water. It was a conglomeration of attractions that this attract people to that general area. I want to show this to you before you leave, by okay, the way. No, I'm, I'm very, when were you there? Uh, about a year ago. Yeah. Baltimore, um, in 1978, was uh, a, yeah. an industrial body of water. Right. And the Rouse Company uh, actually turned that entire place around. The Rouse Company um, came to New Orleans and did the Riverwalk uh, yeah. and, and actually um, were just purchased by the Howard Hughes Corporation. But it's all based upon these same principles of mixed use, of 24-7 life. And, and that project actually reanimated the entirety of downtown Baltimore, absolutely. which was a slum at that time. Yes, absolutely. That's the opportunity we have here today. Right. It's being done here in Louisiana. Baton Rouge is moving in this direction at a rapid rate. Right. And I made a statement a year ago. Baton Rouge has come so far, you can't turn it back. It's going to be a success story in just a few years. That's your opportunity. They don't have your market. You're growing at a faster rate than Baton Rouge is growing on a percentage basis. It's exponential. Absolutely. And so it's an opportunity. If we don't take advantage of it now, you just assume forget it, you're downtown. And you're right. so right about if, that. If uh, I could, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, I, I just simply wanted to impact what you're saying yeah. because I have actually seen it. And anybody go that would visit Baltimore, Maryland, yeah. you will see a replica of what he's talking about right now and how it attracts so many people. Yeah. Uh, 24, well not 24, 7 of course, but 7 days a week, and especially on weekends. Children, uh, mothers, uh, fathers, and they're buying things in the various stores, eating. Yes. So it's, it's a fantastic report, and Thank you. Uh, I, I just love it. Thank you so much. Well, I just um, got to add what, what Steve was saying. He was talking about this. This is, um, that's real numbers based on the April 30 jobs report that came out of um, Bad News Department of Economic Development, I'm sure I read it in half getting in, um, picking in, but basically it, for the 12 months in April 30, the Lake Charles MSA added 7,400 jobs. Yeah. Um, we were number two to Bad News just in raw numbers, because they had 7,700, but Bad News is four to five times larger than that, so that's the equivalent of dropping 35,000 jobs into Bad News, so we see that the growth is here, in Lake Charles, yeah. I mean, that, the, the growth is started, um, it's going to continue for the next five to seven years, so we, we need to be, um, we need to move um, quickly. Okay, obviously, we need to, to dial our eyes and cross our eyes, but, but um, we, we're a little behind the curve, but we can get ahead of this, and it is a great opportunity, like I said, it's, it's something that um, uh, the young people are coming, and we hope they can deliver some of the and we understand, and this is an opportunity to do that. Well, there's one thing else I, I just need to add, add to uh, what you're saying. Uh, we have tried various options in the past, and uh, it wasn't really anything solid that we could depend upon. Uh, it was just a, a more or less a gesture, uh, because when you're serious, you're going to bring money. And so at this particular point in my mindset, I would certainly like to see this become a reality because this could be something that could jumpstart our city to a, a level that we can't even imagine. And so I'm so happy to see such a, a, a positive report that you brought forth to us, and we hope that we can bring this into fruition, that one day we will be able to sit back in our rocking chairs and say we had something to do with that, yeah. and let our children and grandchildren enjoy and build on top of that which we already built. So thank you so much, thank Steve. You. Last week we presented to, or two weeks ago we presented to the DDA, and I, and I, I had a statement that I said that uh, Jocelyn Elders used frequently. She said that societies grow great when old men and old women plant trees whose shade they will never see. 
That's, right. that's what we're doing. That's right. But hopefully we'll see the shade. That's right. Anyone else with any questions? Ms. Morris? Question, state, and I, you know, I, I'm not saying that this isn't a great thing to happen. When I'm going to take all that grounding, I mean, it's just uh, we still have to look at funding uh, to make sure that all of these things are going to cost money. So I'm not trying to put a wrench, but let's get back to reality too. Because it is going to cost a lot of money up front. We still have things and priorities that we have to look at. So, I, you know, I would like to know where that funding is going to come from. <coughs> and also, too, um, when you say that. We're in this big room, and that's great. And I know for seven years they're projecting such a big growth. Mm -hmm. However, after yeah. growth or tent, then tell me other people are going to say. Yeah. And, um, and that's let me, let me, uh, right. uh, those are great questions. Can I answer real quick? Sure. Before. Yeah, the list, the, the, the projections are this is going to be about, at the end of the pipe, there's going to be about during the, the boom, there were about 20,000 temporary construction workers making good money. And at the end, now that's not all going to be at one time. And, and I think, depending on what, what Southsaw does with the gas to liquids, um, that time horizon for temporary workers may be closer to 10 years. But it's, it's going to be anywhere from 5 to 10 years. But at the end of the pipe, there's going to be roughly 20,000 permanent jobs. And all going to be direct. But we're taking the indirect and the spin off jobs. And I'm not sure they'll multiply the reason, but yeah. we can consider there's going to be 15,000 permanent jobs at the end you, of the pipe. You can play a lot of games with the numbers, Ms. Morris. And, and I, I, I'm scared to play those games. But the better reality is this if we don't do this, mm. I can guarantee you they're not staying. Well, I'm not saying that yeah. not to do it. I'm just yeah. saying also, let's also yeah. look at So your financial side, uh, let's discuss that for a second. I think, um, and Always, when you do work like this, finances, at the end of the day, it will come down to finances and, and parking. Those two things rule the world. So in the score sheet, we're very specific to the developers, questioning them about how do you intend to finance this project? Where is the funds today? Or where are the funds? Are they coming from long-term acquisition processes, or do you have those monies available on hand now? We want to know the immediacy of that. I'm, I'm doing a project uh, in, in uh, New Orleans right now in what's referred to as Old Federal City, and they went through the same process. A Michigan developer came forward. They have $50 million of money to go, and they, they're pushing the client now because they, they need to move. Okay, so, but they, they showed proof of that funding. It was there. Um, this is a development. We've got to take our minds off for a second. This is being a government thing. This is private sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we want private sector. If this was a, a, a property, nine and a half acres, that belonged to uh, Mr. Joe over there, that Mr. Joe could sell that property or, or do whatever we're, we're asking, and it would happen immediately. This can happen immediately. And it's on the water. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Shame on you if you don't do this. <laughs> I'm fine if you got the money. Well, yeah, well, we, I'm not saying that we do, but we're going to find out. Okay. No more dry run. 